Bhagavato Bhagavato Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Just a second. Just a second. So we're going to work with this. The first place that we're going to be working with this is going to be in the Majim and Nikaya. And we're going to use two books tonight. We're going to use the Majima Nikaya, but we're also going to refer to some things in the Samyutta Nikaya, because I want you to hear both of these things. And there's actually a few of them in there. We're going to fish around going through this one section of the Samyutta Nikaya is an eye-opening situation. <laughs> it's really a wonderful thing to discover that what I'm telling you is absolutely right. Okay, so I must have heard it someplace, I bet. Okay, so if you go to page 93 in the Majima Nikaya, if you have the Majima Nikaya, and what I'm taking you to is the Basava Sutta. And I want to point out when we're talking about this subject, there is never a case where you're talking too much about this subject, okay? Until you get to the place where you just don't have any concern about hindrances at all anymore. And then at that point, you know, your brain is starting to get it. So remember before we start doing this, how does the brain work? How does it learn? And the way that it learns is through you saying the same thing over and over and over again. So <clears throat> my issue is to try to make hit a home run <laughs> so that the brain goes, I, I got it. You know, I'm going to remember it forever. And that's where it starts working through your practice and starts really making a difference. So if we go to page 93, we see that in the Sabasava Sutta, what the, um, I'm sorry, 91, in the first part of the Sutta, we see where in section four, the, the Buddha is talking to the monks and his, his, he's going to teach you a discourse on the restraint of all the taints. Now see the problem, this is the kind of thing when we hear this, restraint, of all the taints, we immediately think, oh my gosh, we're gonna to have to work really hard. We're gonna to have to lasso it, tighten the rope and pull them and push them and that sort of thing. That's not the case, but they're just saying, this is what is going to happen. By learning what the Buddha was teaching his own monks, you're gonna learn what the key part, the key message was from him to his monks. And so, in this case, he's saying, in order to learn about how to restrain the taints from happening, he's telling you in this sutta, there's five different ways we can approach this. The first one is the taints should be abandoned by seeing them. The second one is by restraining them. And then the third one is by using them. And the fourth one is by enduring them. And the fifth one is by avoiding them. And the sixth one is by removing them. And the last one is by developing them. So this one is Certainly, uh, it's one that Bhante usually doesn't use this one when he's teaching beginners. And the reason for that is because this one can be misunderstood real easily by some of the words that are in it. But let's just go and peek at what he was talking about. So the first one is about abandoning them. And the way that this sutta is set up is he is first telling you, watch, watch the framework of the sutta. 
it's based on the Four Noble Truths. So the suffering is not being able to restrain the taints. So all of the taints are affecting, okay? And then the cause of this suffering is really because you're getting personally involved in it. So he's going to talk about, he always presents the suffering first, and then he listens to, if it's a person he's with, he listens to them present it to him, what the suffering is. He listens to them talk about what they think the cause is. And then he starts talking and he talks about more precisely what the suffering is. And then he talks about more specifically what the cause of it is. And he's not telling them that, he's never telling these people they're wrong, not really. He is, but he isn't. He has a master of that, you know, he's doing that, but he's not. What he's doing is he's getting them to look deeper, to see with knowledge and vision how it's actually operating. That's what he's always doing. So in a way, this is the way a good therapist, psychologist, or a psychiatrist is, is working with a client the same sort of way. So the first one is restraining. And when he talks about this, he talks about how the monk is reflecting wisely, abides with the eye faculty, unres uh, 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 I'm sorry, with the eye faculty restrained. And while taints and vexation and fever might arise in one with the eye faculty unrestrained, there are no taints or vexation or fever in one who abides with the eye faculty restrained. Now, the interesting part is if you really understand the phrase seclusion of the sense doors, if we, if we understand what, to seclude yourself from the sense faculties or the sense bases, okay, when you're sitting in meditation in the instructions in other suttas, okay, what does it mean to seclude yourself from the sensual uh, pleasure of the eye? It just means close your eyes. That's all it means. So when you restrain yourself from the ear faculty, in that case, it means train your brain to understand that a sound is just a sound and keep telling it, it's sound is just a sound. Sound happens, it arises, it's there, it passes away. Sound is just a sound. And no matter what sound is going on, like you find yourself, you run home, you're gonna have a half hour to sit and go back and you left the door key on your desk at work. <laughs> now you have a bench in the yard in the midst of the traffic and you still have a half an hour. Are you gonna sit? Or are you gonna fret and get really upset because there's noise all around you? You can sit. There's no reason you can't sit unless you have not taught your brain that an, a sound is just a sound. The nose faculty restrained, same thing. An odor is just an odor. Of course, you should be per, you know, careful that you're not somewhere where they're burning plastic and the, the uh, smoke is coming in the window. Good to leave the room, yeah, good to leave her. But what I'm saying is just an odor, like too much cleaner on the floor or um, you know, driving past something that's burning, instead of getting all upset, just set yourself up with the air conditioner and keep driving. You know, With the tongue faculty restrained, with the body faculty restraint. So actually what I'm telling you is there are different kinds of ways of restraining things. Isn't that right? And doesn't it come back to what, how much knowledge do I have about how all of this works? Do I have to make everything be silent in order to sit in meditation? The answer is no. 
Now, of course, when I say that, I'm not saying take a retreat in the middle of Main Street. I'm not saying that. And, and that restraints aren't worth a lot more when you're working on your meditation, developing it. Certainly the value of the retreat is like going up to the land by Chiplin again, where there isn't a sound anywhere all day except birds. And there's no traffic going by except for seven or eight people walking by with the wood on top of their head, they're taking it back to the village to burn, to cook. And there's no cars that went by all day. I'm sorry, there was one car, one car that came by and the whole entire day in like seven hours or something like that. Oh, it's wonderful. That's where you can go to really look for long periods of time and sit very easily. But in the case of everyday stuff, there's no reason for you to be upset if you understand a Nietzsche. And yes, I understand it. I know the definition of it doesn't mean that you understand it. What we're talking about, I wish I had a set of words, you should help me with this, but I understand it because I know the definition. Um, I realize it because I experienced it one time or I've got it, I've totally internally understand it. There's three different levels that are happening there of understanding. And then all of a sudden your mind gets it after you tell it 1000 times that I'm, I know it internally, it, the mind all of a sudden clicks, it knows it. And these things don't disturb you anymore. While taints and vexation and fever might arise in one with the faculties unrestrained, there are no taints and vexation and fever in one who abides with the faculties restrained. And these are called the taints that should be abandoned by restraining. And this is where if a person is really vigorously trying to suppress, suppress and subdue and annihilate and eradicate hindrances, they're missing the point, you see? Restraining them can all be also be remember how this works and start letting it go, relaxing, smiling, and come back. The next one is abandoning it by using it, okay? And this one is abandoned by using it. Now here we reflect wisely um, using the robe only for, now this, they're talking to monks, only for protection from the cold, for protection from the heat, protection from the gadflies, mosquitoes, wind and sun, creeping things, and only for the purpose of concealing the private parts, reflecting wisely he uses his alms food, not for amusement or intoxication or for the sake of physical beauty or attractiveness. He only uses it for endurance and continuance of the body. When I was trained, it was like, okay, it was a big change <laughs> because you know, I used to really like to go through my food very carefully and, and really um, get into really appreciating it, loving it and that sort of thing. I'm not going to lie to you. I still love pizza. Okay. But, but the thing is, the lesson Vanti was trying to get across to me is, can I travel and wherever I am, whatever's in that bowl, can I accept it and sit in a corner and eat it for the sake of energy and continuance of the body? And that's what it is to end discomfort and assist in the continuance of the holy life, considering uh, that this, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings. And I shall be healthy and blameless and I shall live in comfort because of food. But food is energy. It's not, um, you know, it's not um, ribs. It's not baked potatoes and all kinds of things off of a banquet table. It's just food. So essentially, he used to tell me the story when he was in Asia that he, he said, always remember, he told me this before I went to live on the bowl in Sri Lanka for three months. He told me, just remember, no matter what they put in your bowl, um, you can always cut a banana up and put it in with it. Or if they give you a banana, then cut it up and put it in there and just mash it up and just eat. Because the banana takes over everything that's in the bowl. And that's really pretty much was true. <laughs> it was true. You know, he's a rest, he reflects wisely. He uses a resting, resting place only for protection from the cold, protection from the heat, protection from the contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, 
and creeping things and for the purpose of warding off the pearls of a climate for enjoying his retreat. So he's just talking about in this section, everything that you're doing, he uses medicine for the protection of arising, afflicting feelings for the benefit of good health when you're ill. Okay, and the taints and vexation of fever would arise, do not come up when you use things just for this purpose. And I've sat many times outside uh, making my, uh, well, you know, when I was staying in the forest sometimes for a few days and things completely away from everything, uh, just taking this robe that I have on and the other, an extra outer robe and laying it down and sleeping on it. And when we were traveling, um, he had this, uh, you know, he would say, I, he would never sleep on a bed in a motel or hotel. He would always lay a robe out and sleep on that. And the reason was because of the emotional stuff that you can pick up from lying in a bed where somebody was really upset. And so I started doing that too. And it's, it's really true. You sleep a lot better if you protect yourself from these things. So then the taints abandoned by enduring them. Now the next section is about enduring the taints. So it should be um, should be abandoned by enduring. Now the, remember each one of these titles: abandoned by restraining, abandoned by using, abandoned by enduring, abandoned by avoiding, by removing, by developing. All of them say abandoned by, don't they? Just keep this in mind, because what we're unearthing here, what we're digging up here is that the main instruction for a hindrance was to abandon it, relinquish it, let it go, release it. And so then go one step further. What is my practice? What am I doing when, it, when these things come up? Oh, I'm fulfilling what he was saying. Because our practice with right effort consists of anything that is unwholesome to release it, relax, smile, and come back. So we're seeing the unwholesome, whatever the situation is, we are letting it go and relaxing. We are bringing up the smile and coming back, which is the wholesome, and continuing the meditation, which is the ultimate of the wholesome. So you got it. You're doing it. That, that much we, we can say that matches up. So by enduring it, um, and this is where reflecting wisely, he bears the cold or the heat, the hunger, the thirst, the contact with the gadflies, mosquitoes, the wind, the sun, the ants, the creeping things. He endures ill-spoken, unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful or racking or sharp or piercing, disagreeable, distressing and menacing. Wow, lots of adjectives, <laughs> you know, in life. He lets it go. And this is getting used to. And I have a couple students who deeply, deeply, deeply have embraced Anicca in their living situations to the extent where it doesn't matter anymore. And I can listen to those people. Uh, they'll tell me I can listen to those people complain or criticize me or demean me or anything. And it doesn't even matter because I know they're uncomfortable in living the way that this is going on with COVID and, and I'm, I'm not uncomfortable anymore. They've come to a point where they see everything will eventually change, but also that whatever confronts them is always temporary. So abandonment is a big part in this. And while all these things might arise, it says, who does not endure such things? There are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who just it decides to endure them. Allow them to be there to occur and disappear. Once again, it's based on abandonment. Next one is avoiding. And this is like, sort of when I read this, I sort of smiled because it's like hiking in the woods, you know. Stay clear of the elephant, the wild horse, the bull, the wild dog, the snake, the stump, the bramble patch, the chasm, the cliff, the cesspit, or the sewer. Good advice. Good advice. Reflecting wisely, he avoids sitting 
on unsuitable seats, like where there's an ant's nest or next to a hornet's nest. Yeah, okay. And wandering to unsuitable resorts. Watch out where you hike, keep listening while you're walking if you're in a tropical area because you wanna hear what's in the ground, not just what's on top of it. And associating with bad friends since he were to do wise, so wise companions in the holy life might suspect him of evil conduct. So you're careful of who's helping you, who's supporting you. You have to be aware of these things all the time and what's happening. And so this is constantly, you are aware and you're avoiding getting into things that are gonna cause you problems. So this is about mindfulness and paying attention to where you are and what you're doing. And then removing, now listen to this one. Bhikkhu should be abandoned by removing. These taints should be uh, abandoned by removing. So reflecting wisely, he does not tolerate an arisen thought of sensual desire. Number one, he abandons it and removes it, does away with it and annihilates it. He does not tolerate an arisen thought of ill will. So this is gonna go through lust, ill will, and then it's going to talk about, um, lo, it's Lobidosa Moha in this case. It's the um, basically talking about the three different things. He abandons them, removes them, and does away with them. In this way, he annihilates them. Now, see, it doesn't say that, but that's what it really means. By removing them and doing away with them is how he annihilates them. So annihilation here turns out not to be a bad word. Because remember, I said to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, subdue them, suppress them. These were really harsh verbs. But in this case, you're annihilating them by understanding how they work and you're flipping things over, changing it, because that's how you're annihilating them. And while the taints and the vexation and fever might arise, one who does not remove these thoughts, these are, there are no taint spectate, vex, uh, vexation and fever in one who removes them, but you're removing them by understanding how they work. So I was just saying to Dhamma Gavesi before we started this meeting, it's interesting how you can confirm when you watch people practicing uh, what is actually happening to them uh, because is it the meditation that is setting them free or is it the knowledge and vision that is setting them free? The ability to confirm exactly what's going on and understand everything. So the knowledge and wisdom, the knowledge and vision of witnessing it, but then this becomes knowledge and wisdom. I don't have to struggle. So we can still say that the, it, it's safe to say that the practice itself is an effortless effort if you want it to be, if you understand enough how things work. So that's where this, this um, sutta being the second one in, in the book is sort of, I wish it was in the middle of the book. <laughs> that's just me, because I wish that you learned more about certain things before you read this so that you wouldn't dive into misunderstanding about what it meant. But I can see how if you don't have certain uh, things understood before you read this, where you could take it wrong and think this is a lot of work. But actually, it doesn't have to be if you understand what you're doing. Now, the next one talks about the abandoned, abandoned by developing it and goes into the seven factors. Now, this one, uh, you, by developing abandoning the taints by developing them, he's talking about he develops mindfulness, enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. So he's letting go of everything because he is um, uh, developing his mindfulness factor, but then it's talking about all of these factors, the enlightenment factor, um, the energy enlightenment factor, the joy enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, the um, concentration level 
tuning your concentration or collectedness. And then the equanimity enlightenment factor, which is supported by um, um, seclusion, disenchantment, and cessation and ripens in, in relinquishment. So everything ripens in the end with a relinquishment. So what is it telling you? It's telling you everything is going from this much tension in your head to relinquish it, let it go, let it go, let it go. And everything is working down through your whole entire being to a point where you're in perfect place. You don't feel your body anymore. You're in a deep state of sitting and you reach without trying to reach, you come to the point where you have the conditions are right to fall over into cessation. And cessation is basically no tension and tightness. So everything is should be working towards that. There shouldn't be exhaustion. There shouldn't be irritability, frustration, anxiety, or anything like that having to deal with the practice if you're understanding. And if there is, if there is, it just tune down your energy, tune down trying so hard and smile more. The biggest message Bonte passes along in his personal retreats, you have to smile more because when you smile, how do you feel? <laughs> That's, you know, and we, when we're in our meditation, we're serious about developing our meditation and we're going to be very careful about, and we find ourselves like this instead of smiling, you know, but those who are smiling, they zip right along the path. I'm telling you, it's right in my charts. I can point to it in the retreats. And if you met those people, you'd begin to understand they're the ones that are making smooth, systematic progress because they keep smiling through the whole exercise. So that one basically is, is the conclusion in this is this is how you are um, uh, using these seven pieces to let go of the chains. And then we skip number three because that's not going to tell us much. But then when we go, well, in number three in section eight and nine through 15, where it repeats the same thing again and again, that is pretty nice. Um, if you listen to this, because this is about things that go on for everybody, um, when you have a problem with greed and hate, there is a middle way for abandoning of greed and hate. Giving vision, giving knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. What is the middle way? It is just the Noble Eightfold Path. And so that is what is tuning your practice of right effort and supporting you and right effort is actually a part of that path. Okay, and it mentions all the eight parts of the eightfold path. And then it says basically, this is the middle way, giving vision, giving knowledge, and it leads to peace. So all these things that we see these parts all over the place of Buddhism, how do we get them to come together is by remembering he was a meditation teacher. And of course, this comes back to human resources with me and his only job he ever had as his profession for life was a, a development of people through meditation and teaching them how to get the optimal potential out of their brain and their mind and operation for everything. So this is what he was. He was this meditation teacher. And so then as an example, he gives you evil herein is anger. The evil herein is anger and resentment, contempt and insolence. These are the different pieces you hear in other sutras as well. So they, the anger and resentment is one, contempt and insolence is another envy and avarice, then deceit and fraud, obstinacy and rivalry, conceit and arrogance, vanity and negligence. 
And once again, he says, basically, there is a way for the a middle way for abandoning this is to follow this Eightfold Path, get it operational. And the first one, the right view is to flip, change your approach to everything, how you see things. And you shouldn't be asked to do this. In my opinion, you shouldn't be asked or instructed, please do that. You should play with a person and say, look, do this for a week and see what happens. We did it with somebody in Australia one time and everybody's responded to this person for the first time in, in his life before nobody paid any attention to him. But then when he changed his angle of living into an impersonal approach to everything, all of a sudden he wasn't aggressive in their eyes. He was open and then his whole life changed completely. Um, so taking the, I'm not gonna go through all of the pieces of the Eightfold Path, you know them. The next one is four. In four, number four, the Baya Barawa Sutta. This is the second one usually I go to for hindrances. And the interesting part about the Baya uh, Barawa Sutta, it's called Fear and Dread. And the interesting part here, this is an alternative way of handling it by letting it go and replacing it with a positive. So when you find the negative, the Buddha was demonstrating to the monks, I tried this and this is working pretty well for him because what he made a commitment, he embraced the positive contradiction from what was negatively attacking him or pressing him down and was stopping him. So if we listen to this list, it's very, very interesting. Um, if they go into the remote jungle thicket to rest for resting places in the forest. And they're unpurified in their bodily conduct or unpurified in their, um, their verbal conduct or unpurified in their mental conduct. So you have the body, speech, and mind, and they're unpurified. He simply makes a commitment to keep his precepts and makes a commitment to try again the next day. And when I go in there, I'm going to be purified in my thoughts about the bodily conduct or thoughts about the verbal speech or thoughts period i'm only going i'm going to start applying the precepts and applying the opposite but this whole thing is definitely about abandonment but it's also about bringing up the counterpart and so when you look at this list it starts with bodily and then verbal and then mental conduct then it reviews um livelihood for the lay person, a livelihood. And are, how are you feeling by, you know, I had a friend and she was working in a factory. She was really happy she got this job. She was making 28 or $30 an hour, which was great money, but she couldn't sleep and she was losing her appetite, but I couldn't understand what was wrong. And I kept asking her and she said, look, I'm really proud of what I do. I produced these parts for the military. And, and then one day we were having lunch and I said, so what are these parts? She said, well, these are the parts. The intricate parts are made by my company that make the guidance system work for the um, missile when they shoot it to kill all the people. <laughs> and I'm there and this is you losing your sleep and not being able to eat and really in trouble over feeling guilty about what you're doing, but you're gonna keep this job. And she tried to keep it, but it didn't work out. She finally had to leave it. And as soon as she left it, it was like, oh God, well, that's over. You see, this is not a Buddhist. This is just a real thing. <clears throat> and it's happening to just an average person. And they couldn't, be responsible for building that part to make this work 
in the delivery system, it was for the targeting mechanism in the delivery system for the missile when you fire it to get to the location to just do what it does. And our conversations, you know, at lunch for a while about that were, it's just such a tiny thing we deal with, just a tiny piece. But look where it went for her in her mind. So she changed jobs and she did fine after that. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are covetous and full of lust go into the forest, they have problems. But I go into the forest uncovetous. You see what he's doing? And then a mind with ill will and intentions of hate, I go into the forest with loving kindness. That's how I go in the forest. And he doesn't have any problem. To overcome sloth and torpor, I will go into the forest without sloth and torpor. He'll probably walk back and forth and get his energy up and then go into the forest because we know the solutions mentioned for sloth and torpor was to walk forward and backward and rev up the energy in the body. Then overcoming restlessness and an unpeaceful mind. I, these are done through affirmation. I will have a peaceful mind and I will sit for an hour. There you go. Uncertain and doubting, I have gone beyond doubt. Given to self-praise, and I will go not given to self-praise. I will uh, have a subject of, to, I am subject to alarm and terror. I have fear when I go in the forest, but I am free from trepidation. So these are declaring, I will be free from trepidation. Now, I will tell you something. These really work. I tested them one time. And um, the thing was, you're, you, you, if you do this in the beginning of your practice, it might not work so well. But once you have your mind, your communication with your mind operating, and it's listening to you and, and you, you, you're communicating well with it, then when you state an affirmation, what you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. That's what we're told in 19. And he was lecturing the monks in Sutta number 19. So if you tell your mind, that you are full of alarm and terror and dive into it. And that experience was like, you've heard me talk about the tree when the tree fell on me. And that was my initial thing was feeling the alarm and terror just come up and I started laughing. And then I passed out. <laughs> and then I came back and looked the next time I came back and look at the situation different and I passed out. It was a nasty thing what happened, this accident. So, but I kept, I was, activating my mind in something other than alarm and terror. I was, I could see very quickly how I could immediately in a car accident or the tree accident or the equipment accident or anything go into, oh my gosh, what will happen if I can't walk? What will, you see what happens? You throw yourself into the future. What will happen if my legs don't come back? Because I couldn't feel them in that case. But I'm, then I said, I'm not there yet. I had heard enough about the past, the future, and the present every night in Dhamma talks over and over again. So don't surrender to the future of what might happen because you're getting what if itis, the irritation of the what if part of your brain. And I started laughing. You see, I am free from trepidation. Okay, desirous of gain, honor, and renown, I have few wishes. None of that's important. Just figuring out how to get people to a level where they will automatically get their six R's going. I'm lazy and wanting in energy. I'm energetic. Unmindful of not and not fully aware, I will establish my mindfulness. Unconcentrated with a straying mind, I am possessed 
of focused mind or concentration in a productive level of concentration, not too tight, not too loose. And I considered when uh, these types of uh, meditators go into the forest devoid of wisdom, drivelers resort to these remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom. Ah, that's their problem. Hmm. They are devoid of wisdom. And what does wisdom mean? It means understanding dependent origination. They're devoid of understanding how the suffering actually happens, the mechanism of it. They haven't been taught. And so they don't even understand how to go back through that and take a look to see where they were. Oh, wow, I'm in this trouble thinking about the future. Oh, wow, that's something I did in the past in other events too. Oh, wow, I was clinging. Oh, wow, I was craving. We can do that. They can't. They've never had the chart. They've never learned the links. So they're caught without that knowledge and they don't know how to get out of it except to fight with it. That's what happened here. When we lost dependent origination as a teaching within the Buddhist system, we really did a, a disservice, but people didn't realize what that disservice was. They didn't know because they hadn't had it. And it's been a long, long time. I mean, you know, take 500 years easily that my teacher said, and I said to my teacher said, and his teacher said to him, and his teacher said to him, and his teacher said to him, and that's what's happening here. And we are not taking seriously that each generation is responsible to keep asking questions and to smoke out the sheds before you put the harvest in the, in the barn. It means disinfect the shed. It means go back and see what exactly was said about this topic. And so it's right here, right in front of us. So then he's talking about uh, more things in that sutta about the, um, mm -hmm, right using the jhanas and going through the jhanas and it reflects on that and it says the first knowledge, second knowledge, third knowledge, which is one of the ways that if a student is getting it really fast, you can teach them these three knowledges. Sometimes they can go right to the heart of the matter. It's not often you find it, but I've seen it done and it does work if the person is ready. Now it is because of these sorts of things uh, that the, the Buddha still resorts to resort, remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. And when he has a pleasant abiding for himself here and now, he has compassion for future generations and he continues to go into the forest. And Master Gautama made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright. I just love this one phrase. I just can't always remember it precisely, but what he did was he turned upright what had been overthrown, revealed what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost and holding up a lamp in the dark for those who have eyesight to see forms. That's what he does. That's what we're trying to do for you. We're trying to force you to look, not just look deeper and hold all the stuff you knew before, but let everything go and take the instructions purely the way that the Buddha advised Vacha to do in Sutta number 72 in section 18. And he told him, you've heard me say that many times, Vacha, this is hard and difficult to understand whenever you take another practice or another set of directions or have another teacher and another training involved in your mind at the same time. That's why we, when we're teaching you to him, we suggest taking the Brahma Viharas and using them because then you are not caught in a place where you have to make myself stop doing this 
with the breathing meditation and do this instead. So I want to point out to you, Monty does not advocate don't ever do the breathing meditation again. That's not what is taught. When he asks you to use the Brahma Vihara approach, he's asking you to use this because it's new and you can do just what I'm telling you to do. And that way you will progress fast with training the brain to use the six R's. Then if you want to step over and go to treat, retreat with a, I don't care, 4,000 other people and you're sitting there and you're doing breathing, it's fine, but now you can check out, once you have it going automatic, you can check out and see if you can just urge the mind when anything comes to bother you, can I let go, relax, smile and come back? Yeah. So he's not saying give it up forever. He's saying learn what the mechanism was for the operation of a successful meditation that gets you to the path. Then if you move over there, you can probably, because you, your mind knows this is the best way to let go, relax, smile and come back, you can do it with breathing. Or if you're staring at a, at, at a casino and something bothers you, you can do it then. You can do it in any situation. This is like the extreme interpretation of something that goes overboard, thinking that we said what, yesterday it was an issue about the Vasudhimaga. Your teacher says you should destroy the book. My teacher never said destroy the book. He said, take a look at what the book is and remember what it is which is a reference book. It is not a main source book. And consider what it would be like to go back to the main instructions that the teacher originally said and see if you understand it slightly differently. Would things operate the way they're described in the text? This is why we got so excited because then we saw people able to go to the path have it operate in short periods of time, experience the different levels of understanding just the way it was described in the book. This became exciting because these shorter periods of experiencing these things, meeting them, greeting them, learning how they operate, even using them in life became possible. And it wasn't just a story or a literary thing or a way of signing off a sutta or a mythological thing somebody said. It wasn't, it was real. And that was what is, in, is, is incredibly fun is to get the person to let go of things and follow the instructions and have us, all we're doing, if you've been to one of our retreats, you know this, okay? All we're doing in retreats is seeing if you can stay on this line for the entire retreat without falling off. And when you fall off, that's why we're interviewing you each day. Because if you fell off, I don't want you to be working after you fell off the track for three days and then have one or only two interviews in 10 days. But if I catch you and put you back on track, that's the job of the guide is just Catch, catching you in a way that you can't quite see how it happened and we're just pointing and believe me it is a whole big set a whole big group of problem solution problem solution problem solution that I had to learn in order to be able to see what it is and the questions we designed do reveal what it is just by listening to you tell us what is happening so super that that works anyway. So the next one you want to go to is 22. And 22 uh, is the Alagadupama Sutta. And I think it's really exciting uh, to go to the Alagadupama Sutta and look at what's happening to the monk named Arata. And Arata's issue was that he believed, and this is very specific, you know, about the hindrances. He believed that if something came up when you were meditating, 
it's okay to move over there for a while. <laughs> you see, that's what he believed. And he believed sincerely, I think he believed that that's what the Buddha was teaching. And so when the monks came, there was the issue for him was he was in the meditation school. And this is the problem because new people are coming in, they're asking how to do it and he's informing them the wrong way. And then what happens is the monks are upset about this. And so they go and get the Buddha and the Buddha comes back and then he has to question him himself. And um, when the Buddha comes, the Buddha says to him, Arati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct you if you engage in them. This is what he says. But then Arati answers exactly so, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, that is true. That's basically what he says. And then the Buddha says, misguided man to whom have you ever known me to teach the dhamma in this way misguided man have i not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct you when you engage in them so basically i have stated in in many ways, he starts to explain all the different, this is kind of fun, he starts to explain all the different analogies or similes that he teaches, and there's close to 13 of them here listed in section six. And these are very simple lessons. And when you go through all of these, you can find the, find the actual similes, you, can, you have to go to I think it's 54, Sutta 54, to actually find all those similes. But when you go to 54 and you start going through all the little things that he was teaching one by one, you find out that pretty much it's the same message. If you follow my instructions, this is how it works and it won't hurt you or you won't die or something like that. In the case of the snake, we start with that one. If you pick the snake up by the tail, the instructions are don't pick it up by the tail. The snake will come back up around your arm and bite you on the wrist and you'll die. Bad idea, don't hold the tail. He'll climb himself and bite you. This is true. I like snakes and I handle them a lot. And <laughs> this is definitely true. You always pick the snake up by the head. If you pick it up by the head, you control what can hurt you and then you, you let it go and it doesn't hurt you and you don't hurt the snake. Another one was about the pit of coals. The coals is a similar, it's familiar lesson because I lived in the North and the children always had to learn to just touch the hot stove one time, the wood stove, so that they would stay away from it every child has done it with at least their finger if they didn't bump into it, but you want to teach them this is hot and this is what hot means. And they stay away from it. But the lesson of the coals is simple when you're when you're lifting the coals out of the stove or cleaning out the the hot cinders, you don't pick them up with your hand and put them in the bucket. <laughs> you pick them up with the scoop and put them in the bucket. So if you're trying to figure out all these different ways of getting them out of there, you need the scoop to put them in the bucket. It's a simple lesson. And so he's trying to get it across in, in, uh, the, when, in, 50, in this one, in the Aligadupama Sutta. But what he's trying to tell when he says this statement, if you listen to it again, and you can change one word because I think it's kind of the wrong word in the translation. I talked to somebody about it, but you can say misguided man 
have I not stated in many ways how obstacles, obstructive things or obstacles are obstructions, become obstructions. So the reason I say, say obstacle instead of, um, instead of using the word ob obstructions twice is because it's an obstacle. It seems like an obstacle, but it only becomes an obstruction if you pay attention to it. So what it's saying to you here is the same thing that you're gonna hear in, San, in the Samuel to Nikaya when you listen to what the nutriment for a hindrance is. Ah, now we're getting down to the breast tax. What is the food that makes the hindrance work, okay? Is there really something that makes it work? And if I take that away, if I take the supply of the nutriment away, the hindrance will just fade away? And the Buddha is saying, yes, that's real. Because he's showing you how important it is in the one discussion in the Samyutanikai because he reflects on the what the obstacle is doing when there's an obstruction there that is really bothering you. It's keeping the enlightenment factors from development. So what's so important about these seven factors of enlightenment? You can't go into cessation if the seven factors of enlightenment do not come into precise balance. It's at that moment that these seven pieces all of a sudden go and fall into cessation. That's what's real about this. So you, what controls these, you start, you're actually, you're playing with all these pieces. You've heard about them and you are, you are paying attention to them in your practice by how they work and how they affect your practice from the time you begin training. So what are they? Mindfulness, which is the balancing piece, the mindfulness. And then on the teeter-totter that's above, the mindfulness brace. Okay, that's your observation. And then you have investigation, energy, and joy on this side. And on the other side of the, of the teeter-totter, if we were to go the other side here, what happens is you have tranquility, collectedness, and equanimity, okay? You notice something about this teeter-totter for a second, you know, the way this works, the seesaw, okay? Notice how it works is on this side, you have three components that have a lot of energy in them. You need a lot of energy to do your investigation. The energy is mentioned and the joy has the element of energy, energetic in it, in it, it has that in it. Even if it's flowing through your whole body coming out of every pore, there is an element of energy in there. But on the opposite side of the teeter-totter, you have tranquility, okay. You have balancing the collectedness, the concentration, getting it into a productive, perfect productive level of concentration and um, and uh, equanimity, the balanced mind, the balance of your mind, the calmness. So these energy, calm, and mindfulness is paying it, watching this, having to do with observation of it. So these become really important. So if there is something that will keep you from having your enlightenment factors come up, if there is, one of the biggest ones is if you're fighting with hindrances, if you're doing, if you're fighting with them, trying to, to stop them, subdue them, suppress them, hold them down, make them stop. But if you're letting them be and letting them go and just allowing them to run their course and Nietzsche takes care of it and let it go. And, and you, in order to do that, you have to buy into the knowledge that the hindrance has nothing for you, for the meditation, for the function of it, the operational part. It has nothing for you. Now, what it does have as a teacher, 
is important because why we say as a teacher all the time, you always emphasize it's don't send them away. I didn't say when they come knock on the door and you're in the next room and you're meditating that you have to scream, go home. <laughs> I didn't say that. They can come in just, you can, you can pause for a second. The tea's on the table, the cookies are there, have some, I can't join you. Just leave it, I'll clean up and just go back to your meditation, so to speak. It's like a tea party, but you can't go over there and have a conversation with them. You stay and you just meditate because you know they haven't brought anything but gossip. <laughs> They're not bringing you the secret of anything, okay? However, if the same one comes again and again and again, and you find yourself running out of cookies, <laughs> okay? It's interesting to figure out why is that one coming again and again and again? And sometimes it's something we need to forgive. Sometimes it's something else, uh, some other reason. So as a teacher, it's pointing to where you have the most, I don't like this or the most, I, I like this, the lust or the greed or the hatred and aversion issue. That's what it's about. That's what the teaching part is. And the signal is if that one comes back again and again and again, you need to stop and do a little bit of research, but it's not going to tell you. It's, it's not going to tell you anything like that, okay? But to me, the what's in Ali Gadupama, the reason it's so great is definitely got to be because when he says, when he says, when he says, um, when he says uh, directly to the monk, misguided man, have I not stated in many ways that obstacles are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct you is when you engage in them, is, is uh, one who uh, obstructs one who engage. It always obstructs you if you engage in it. So the food for the hindrance is your personal attention. So you have to stop paying attention to it. Okay, now the next one, um, anyway, the command that comes out of that sutta is like, it always strikes me this image of you're on a horse and you are the commander. You have 5,000 men on the hillside about to attack 5,000 men coming down the other hillside. And you're, you're holding your hand up and saying, do not engage. That's your command to the troops. Do not engage until I say, go, do not engage. And for us, it means don't engage the hindrance, allow it to pass away, stay, stay stay with your object of meditation. That's what it is. Next one is 62. If we go to 62, we find the lesson that we often talk about in the Maha Rahulawada Sutta. And the point where he is talking to his son, this is the Buddha talking to his 18 year old son in this sutta and he's concerned that he become very proficient in his meditation training. And Rahula is practicing under the instruction of Sariputta. So when the Buddha gets there, he's told he's here, he's practicing his breathing meditation. And the Buddha says, I, I need to see him. And he tells him where he is and he goes to where he is and starts giving him some lessons. And I think the most significant part of this is in section 18 to 21, where it's telling, it's actually 17. No, I'm sorry, 18, it's verse, section 18 to 21, okay? And in those sections, it's simply saying, Rahula, 
develop meditation on loving kindness for when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. Now, remember these four pieces, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity are causally related. We've already discovered this. If you've been listening to me teaching you, we already know they, they happen in a causal relationship. You experience them in a causal relationship. When the, the, the loving kindness is ready, it moves up into the head, it changes into karuna. When it gets to a certain point, it changes into the joy. When it gets to a certain point, it changes into equanimity. So it is a causal relationship, meaning it compounds, it compounds one to the other, to the other, to the other, like this way also. By that, I mean, once you start practicing your loving kindness, you're abandoning all thoughts of ill will. The mind can't do two things at once. That's a law. And so understanding that, if you're practicing metta, while you're practicing the metta, the ill will is gone. When it learns that ill will needs to just stay away and you start practicing compassion, thoughts of cruelty are abandoned too. And then with the development of altruistic joy, altruistic joy, people have different ideas about this, but I really will tell you, I had a very sincere experience of what that meant. And it's like an empathetic joy for someone else's success. And I was so overwhelmingly happy that they succeeded in what they were trying to do. And that's what this kind of joy was pointing to. But it is just a joy. It's just joy. But it's tripped off by that. And that was like a marker. And for me, it was very real. For some people, they don't have that experience. That's fine. Um, but for me, I really can see why they said this. And when you're this altruistic joy is going on for you personally, you have no discontent about anything, not about anything. You're so happy for that other person. Okay. And then when you develop your meditation on equanimity, any aversion is abandoned. And this is a big one. And if I was drawing this on the board. We go to the board real quick, just for a minute and show you that when I build the, we saw that there were 16 pieces in, I don't know why that won't come up. It doesn't want to come up. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, let's try again. There, okay. Now, um, We've been to some suttas now that had five pieces, six pieces. Um, we saw um, six, no, I, I think we saw 16 pieces in um, sutta number four. There's another one, the next one we go to, it has 11. I'm talking about hindrances, but what we find that's interesting when we put a chart together, trying to look at all the different places, mentioning hindrances, you can play with this yourself and you start with the loving kindness and it's calling it, oops, ill, right? It's calling it ill, right? <laughs> ill will, and then uh, cruelty, and then discontent, and then aversion. Now, so you see, I'm pulling the four pieces up here. I'm pulling them from the loving kindness or the Brahma Viharas practice. Then you take the five suttas, which were the lust and, lust and greed, hatred, aversion. Um, and then you had um, 
sloth and torpor. And then you had restlessness, guilt. And then you had uh, doubt. And then you go to the other suttas and you would list six here. And then you would have 16 that went across here, et cetera, and so forth, okay. And then you go to another one and you have 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And the game is, can you relate these pieces to these seeds? And we played this game in a, ret a retreat I was teaching in Malaysia, where we had about 12, 11 women, I think, or 12 women involved. And we tried to see if these pieces down here relate to these pieces on the top. And can you see how they, there, there's going to be lines that are connecting them, you see? And so you decide how that works. And you'd be, you'd be surprised. I was very surprised there were only two things out of 11 suttas and all the things that we listed. Um, uh, there were only, um, uh, only two things that we could not say went directly up to those four seeds. So why am I doing this? I guess because I'm a mother. <laughs> and, uh, and the Buddha took his son by himself. This, this, this sutta is not taught to a group of monks. It's taught to Rahula alone. And he's getting close to the age where um, he's going to leave and he's going to teach somewhere else as a monk. So he, it's almost like an opportunity to give his son an edge sort of on this whole thing and saying to him, uh, it's a good idea if you learn the Brahma Viharas first and master these, and then you can use the breath is sort of what I'm picking up from this sutta. You have to read it a number of times. You have to actually read a couple other suttas to understand where I'm coming from with this. But if that's the case, he was giving him an edge by understanding if you can let go of these four pieces, you let go of a big, huge list of things fall away because those things are all related to being a problem through these four seeds. And if that's true, and I think it is, okay, uh, then by telling you when you're using the Brahma Viharas, the reason they're important is because when you use them, this is what happens, he says. And he also points to him as a young man at 18, he points to him about the importance of developing his, um, his equanimity in relationship to a meditation on foulness. And the meditation on foulness is so that young men or women, they do not get overly sexually excited. They're more in balance with the attraction to the opposite sex. So he's saying this to him that that's, that's what is good for you to practice and really master this. And then he won't get into trouble at all. That's what he was doing in my opinion. And then we see that uh, he, he um, then assures him again about the instructions for the breathing meditation. He repeats the instructions. And this is one of the suttas that was changed by order of Bhikkhu Bodhi about experiencing the whole body and the of breath, body of breath, of breath was taken away. When you get into the fourth edition, he takes that out and he gives you an explanation why he takes it out in note number 141. So if you ever have, I think it's the fourth edition, maybe it's in the third, but I, I know it's in the fourth and fifth editions that um, he takes that away because we had, Bonte had a talk with him in New York about this and said, you know, please reconsider this. This is not what this meant. It, it's merely just meant, um, the body itself, 
relaxing the body itself from head to toe. Yeah. Okay. So that's what happened in that one. And the next one you go to is 128. You go to 128. When you go to 128, actually for this lesson, you only need to go to the summary of the whole thing. And so you go to the last page of 128 and you will be at section 30. And this has 11 different distractions that you have to deal with with your meditation. Everybody does. So it has the doubt, and then it has sloth and torpor. It has fear. It has elation. It has inertia. It has excess of energy and deficiency of energy. It has longing where we, where we get caught in this idea, what am I gonna do? It's near the end of the retreat. I have to get to Nibbana. I have to get to Nibbana this. And then we can't progress anymore. Perception of diversity and excessive meditation on forms, too much meditating. You need to take a break, this is real. And heavy duty meditators, if they usually figure this out, you get to a place where you're just, it's not working, but you're working real hard. You might be sitting six hours, seven hours or something, just not working, nothing, no progress. You need a day off. And the idea is go put your toes in the river and take a swim and take a walk on the beach, do something that is just allowing you to chill and not have to meditate. Next day, when you go back, bang, everything really starts cleaning up and changing in the in the uh, practice and it opens up usually. It meant that you were stale. That happens if you're doing it too much. So what he's basically, his message in this whole entire sutta, I understood that doubt is an imperfection of the mind. So he's calling these distractions imperfections of mind and had abandoned doubt and imperfection of mind. That's what he decides to do, abandon it. So when I understood inattention was an imperfection of mind and had abandoned inattention and I abandoned sloth and torpor, abandoned fear, abandoned elation, abandoned inertia, abandoned excess energy, abandoned deficiency of energy, abandoned longing, abandoned perception of diversity, abandoned excessive meditation upon forms. Then I thought I have abandoned those imperfections of mine. Let me now develop uh, my observation and the level of my collectedness in three ways. And he pursues uh, going through the and started going into path and goes through the jhanas and the road signs one by one on the jhanas. One, two, three, four, it goes right through because once he's learned to abandon. So one of the quickest ways to get to Nibbana is to understand very precisely how these distractions work and drill your mind, convince your mind to believe that they are insignificant. And then you can go much longer. Okay, I'm not gonna do 138. I'm gonna take you into the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, Bhante, how, how long do I have? Half hour, how long? Uh, you can go on, uh, uh, it is uh, eight o'clock now. Okay, this is good. All right, now the first one I want to go to in this before we pick through it is the Samyutta Nikaya, this Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, this the, the Samyutta Nikaya. And it's in the Bojanga Samyutta. It's on page 1597. 
And this is the one that I mentioned to you already in relationship, direct relationship to the enlightenment factors. It's in a section called nutriment and it's in the discussion section. At Sawati, I will teach you the nutriment and the denourishment in regards to the five hindrances and the, the seven enlightenment factors, factors of enlightenment, okay? Listen to me, he says. When, because you understand what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire? What causes it, this sensual desire to come? And for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire, same thing, more of it will cause this. There is, monks, the sign of the, oh, wait, we don't want to do this, wait a minute, this is the wrong one. Well, okay, there is the sign of the beautiful, fourth jhana, fourth jhana, okay, frequently giving careless attention to, to it is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of arisen sensual desire. We say fourth sign of the beautiful is the fourth jhana and why is that one the cause of frequently giving the careless attention to it why would you do that when you're first learning meditation because when you hit the fourth jhana this is where things really start to feel really good and you're losing your body and you're deeply in and you're feeling this other kind of joy more in the bracket of rapture sort of thing inside more beyond different from the uplifted joy that you feel in the first jhana and people like it people like it and they want more of it so this is one of the things that can cause a problem. And it says here, frequently giving careless attention to this is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of arisen sensual desire. So there it is, careless personal attention. It's right there, okay? Now, what is the nutriment for the arising of the ill will or for the increase and expansion of the arisen ill will? Well, he's telling you the sign of the repulsive, frequently giving careless attention to that is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen ill will and for the increase and expansion of the arisen ill will. So when he's saying here, they're using careful attention versus careless attention on the, on the, uh, on the um, distraction, the hindrance, okay? And so he goes through all five in this section, he goes through all five of the he does it with sloth and torpor the same way. He does it with restlessness, guilt, and remorse the same way. He does it with the doubt the same way and explains what it is. The second section is now the nutriments for the enlightenment factors. So now you're going to find out how do I provide nutriment for the factors of the enlightenment, okay? What is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness? How do you get it to come up into that level and keep working in that level? There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of mindfulness. 
frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness. That's it. There you go. Pay attention with your mindfulness very carefully. It's your observation. Watch closely. Don't let anything come in to pull you and stop you from observing. Keep watching, okay? And what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of investigation of states? Now here, they call this discrimination of states. It's a little bit different, but it's the same thing. It's your investigative technique into the state of your mind. And for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of the investigation of states. And the same thing, wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states with their counterparts, frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of investigation of states. You're watching carefully, you're allowing things to come up, go on, go away again. You're not making anything happen. You're just learning to watch. That's your discrimination, investigation. Next one they did with the factor of energy and how do you, uh, there is the, the element of the arousal, the endeavor and the exertion, frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising and unarisen of the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy. Okay, the nutriment for the arising of it to come up is one thing. The fulfillment by development of it is another thing. And that's where you're playing with this balancing level of these pieces. You see these little tips of my fingers, all seven of them. And you're playing with balancing them and seeing if you can get them to go click and fall into the next level. So there are certain places in your uh, path where it's very apropos, it's very comfortable for you to work with the balancing of the enlightenment factors at the tail end of nothingness before you go into neither perception or nine perception taking a look at that, just watching it in your mind in the darkness when there's just nothing there. We have used um, a simile of Raiders of the Lost Ark or Last Crusader, I can't remember which one it is, <laughs> that movie where he goes and he's standing in front of a, a deep chasm that is going down and in order to get to get the cup of Christ, he has to go across the chasm to get into the room where the night is to where he has to get the cup, choose the proper cup, you see. And in that movie, uh, Harrison Ford is standing there on the edge of this huge chasm and he, throw, he, throws, he throws some sand out and he realizes there is a a bridge that's very narrow that he can walk across, but he has to see the bridge in order to walk across. And that's sort of what this is like. There's a big chasm in front of you. And now you have these seven factors of enlightenment. And they're like a bar that the guy holds when he's walking on the balancing wire you know, he has to, he holds this with two hands and he goes like this or like that as he's crossing over and walking across the chasm to get to the other side. This is kind of what you're doing. It's sort of like what you're doing because you are there and you don't want anything to disturb you at all. So you're trying to just balance yourself and get these to just be balanced instead of like that or like that. You want to be just like this so that you can walk across the chasm and eventually just keep going 
without being disturbed by anything, you fall in, into neither perception or non-perception. Perfect example. So he takes you through this and explains how it works with energy. And he calls, he says that frequently giving careful attention to this energy balance or the investigation balance or the joy balance, the tranquility balance, the degree of concentration and quality of the concentration, that value and the equanimity, the degree of equanimity without forcing anything, just allowing. So then he also gives you a third section in this. And the third section is the denourishment of the hindrances. How do, what is the denourishment that um, prevents the unarisen sensual desire from arising and arisen sensual desire from increasing. And the opposite sign will pull away from that. So if it is sensual desire, a little bit of the parts of the body, foulness, thinking in that direction, pull you away into balance for that. Or ill will, what stops ill will? Frequently giving careful, um, I'm sorry, let's see what the second one was. Um, what is it that um, the nutriment for arising of unarisen restlessness and remorse for the increase and expansion of the arisen restlessness and remorse. Whoops, I'm in the wrong page. I didn't go back. I went to the wrong one. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. The denourishment, let's see, what because is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen ill will from arising? and arisen ill will from increasing and expanding. The liberation of the mind through loving kindness. Ah, the liberation of the mind through loving kindness. Frequently giving careful attention to that is the nourish, denourishment and prevention of the arisen ill will from arising and the arisen ill will from increasing. So basically telling you that loving kindness is an avenue for liberation of the mind. See, one thing that we're doing is a lot of times when we write, we will say metta takes you all the way to Nibbana. Does it? No. <laughs> takes you to the fourth jhana. That's the culmination of it. Actually, the Brahma Viharas take you all the way to Nibbana. It almost, it takes you to the seventh. And that's nothingness. But what happens at nothingness is that mind becomes the object of meditation. And so this happens as well with the breathing meditator at that point. It mind would be the object of meditation. And then that's used with, we say, quiet mind. Very, very quiet, very long sittings. So quiet, so calm right? And they're both watching mind, both those meditators, the breathing meditator or the Brahma Vihara meditator, it doesn't matter. So there never should be this discussion or picking at each other about saying breath is better than this, this isn't any use, da 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 da. It's a useless discussion. Because if you draw the line and show where the meditator goes, if he's breathing meditator, where the where the Brahma Vihara meditator goes, so the Brahma Viharas, at that point, at nothingness, they come together and they're on the same exact page doing the same exact object waiting to fall into, not, as they're in neither perception or non-perception, mind only, and that's it, until they fall into cessation. The next one is the element of there are vikus, the element of arousal, the element of endeavor, the element of exertion, frequently giving careful attention to them, to the endeavor, okay? Uh, that will cancel out sloth and torpor. The element of your, um, the arousal, the endeavor, arousal of interest is what it means, and the 
endeavor to practice your practice and the exertion that you put into your practice to just stay there and watch. That's what they're talking about. Attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen sloth and torpor or feeds the existing sloth and torpor from increasing and expanding. The next one was the denourishment, which prevents uh, restlessness. And what you should be paying attention is to more peacefulness and frequently giving careful attention to this peacefulness instead of the restlessness, the opposite. So once again, we're playing with embracing the contradiction. So see, in this way, you're learning how you are in control of what you're doing in your meditation. So now you can see also in talking about all this, when we touch on the anatta subject, you can see how confusing that it can be if people think, well, I can't do anything. I'm not supposed to do anything. Well, I tell you, don't do anything when you're meditating, just watch. But you do do things, don't you? And so if we go back and we look into exactly what it is you do. If you want to understand what you, you are able to do, you go back to 111, right? And when you go into uh, the Anupada Sutta and you read at the end of each verse, what is it that he can still do while he is in an aware jhana? This gives you the answer, okay? And this is telling you that... Um, The contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind are still there. They're still active. Those pieces are your aggregates. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. Don't you use those factors to decide what to do next in your meditation? Yes, you do. Yeah. And these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred, known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. There he is, he's watching what all the time? Anicca, 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 Anicca. Like a broken record, he's watching it until mind has it ingrained in him. But all those pieces, the pieces, the components of being able to have an intention, what to do next, a decision, what to do next. You are in control. Nobody else is. You are. One person told me the other day, I can't stop moving. Well, this is a new meditator. She sits down and is, is, met, is moving a lot and shifting, tapping his knee, things like that. Yeah. Well, what I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you expect me to come over and stop you moving? You're the only one that has control over your own body moving. So when we say sit absolutely still, we want you to sit absolutely still. It's up to you to catch this loose motion. And eventually you will see this loose motion is happening from a broken precept. And this is restlessness, guilt, and remorse over something from somewhere. So right now, just be still. And that's the beginning of your training in equanimity. After he does this section, what he does next is he gives you the fourth section, which is the denourishment of the enlightenment factors. And the denourishment of the light, the enlightenment factors uh, and stopping them from reaching the fulfillment is when you give careless attention and it doesn't work. You, you have to stop that. So bhikkhu monks in, is the de denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness from reaching fulfillment by development. There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of mindfulness not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that 
prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness from reaching fulfillment. And what is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor from, from uh, 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 of discrimination, that's investigation, of states from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states from reaching fulfillment by development. There are wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states, and their counterparts not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states from reaching the fulfillment by development. Okay, I hope I did that slow enough for you. So he's basically gonna explain everything. And this is where I got very excited when I got into the going through the Bojanga Samyutta because boy, I thought that the Buddha was great, but I didn't get the marvelous part. <laughs> and he's marvelous. He doesn't leave anything you need to know out of this. When you go through this, it just is amazing how He's talking about these things and he's giving you everything that he experienced and you're getting it able to get out of his words exactly what to do. There's no question. And he tells you why, but at the same time, the underlying message is don't do it because I'm saying it here, doing it for yourself with direct knowledge, getting direct knowledge by knowledge and vision is the most important part of this whole journey here. Um, let me see, I wrote some of these down. Uh, sister, can you uh, tell us uh, the uh, sutta number? Okay, I told you where to start in, in the... Um, Samyutta Nikaya, okay, the discussion that we examined closely began on page 1597. It's the Bojanga Samyutta. Okay. And, and the Sutta, Sutta number? Well, in that section, it's this number six, it's the V and the number, you know, six in Roman numerals discussion section. And then 51, and then I should write it because it's hard to explain in parentheses, yes. there's part of it. Yeah. You go to um, the page is 1597 and it's like this, discussions. And this discussions that we went over, it had um, it had the parts like this, and then you know, like this, the parts of this discussion, and okay, yeah. And it, then this one was called nutriment. about nutriment and they call the number in this section five one and then there's a parentheses with a one like this that's what the number is 51 and one in parentheses nutriment okay now when i'm doing with you now is going backwards through some of the pieces but the whole Bojanga for you guys, the whole Bojanga is worth taking these and chewing on them one at a time. For instance, on page 1589, 
it goes into wholesome and then it goes into corruptions and then it goes into non-corruptions. He's explaining everything. So on 1589, is, uh, it would be uh, 31. Wait, one. I'm sorry, no, 31 like this, okay? And it's talking about wholesome. And when you listen to this, it's really quite wonderful. Um, and it says here is wholesome like that. Whatever states there are that are wholesome, partaking of the wholesome, pertaining to the wholesome, they are all rooted in diligence, converge upon diligence, and diligence is declared to be the chief among them. We would say persistence. Um, and um, when a monk is diligent, it is to be expected that he will develop and cultivate the factors of the enlightenment, the seven factors. And now, does a monk who is diligent develop and cultivate the seven factors? How does he do this? Here, he develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, and it goes through all the pieces, okay, um, all the way to equanimity, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing in total release. It is the way, monks, that a monk who is diligent develops and cultivates the seven factors of enlightenment. You know, one of my favorite um, things, well, let's do this one here. Here's 37. And this one is called obstruction. Obstructions. These are things that you read before you go to work. And when you have a moment, you kind of let them run through your mind. There are these five obstructions or hindrances and corruptions of the mind that weakeners of wisdom. And these five are sensual desire is an obstruction, a hindrance, a corruption of the mind a weakener of wisdom, ill will is an obstruction, a corruption of the mind, a weakener of wisdom. Sloth and torpor is a corruption and a weakener of wisdom. Restlessness and remorse are an obstruction, a corruption of the mind and a weakener of wisdom. And doubt is an obstruction and a weakener of wisdom. These are the five obstructions, the hindrances, corruptions of mind and weakeners of wisdom. And there are monks, these seven factors of enlightenment, which are non-obstructions, non-hindrances, non-corruptions of the mind. And when they are developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of the true knowledge and liberation. What seven are they? The enlightenment factor of mindfulness is the non, a non-obstruction. And the, uh, it goes through the seven pieces, the pieces the, of the enlightenment factor the, uh, all the way to equanimity again. And these are the seven factors of enlightenment that are non-obstructions, non-hindrances, non-corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of true knowledge and liberation. And so I really think the way this is written is really great because then you go away and for the day you think about that. And then you come back and it says what life is like without hindrances. The next one is 38 and then eight in parentheses. The noble disciple listens to the Dhamma with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, directing his whole mind to it. 
on that occasion, the five hindrances are not present in him. On that occasion, the seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment by development in him. So if you give ear, this is what it means by giving ear. It doesn't mean just casually decide to listen. Unfold your arms, sit correctly, don't cross your legs, listen intently, take notes if you want as you're going along. But when you're doing that, exactly as you're listening to the drama, what's happening is the seven factors of enlightenment are actually going to temporary fulfillment and development. And what are these five hindrances that are not present? And it tells you the five hindrances again of sensual desire and then ill will and then sloth and torpor and then restlessness and remorse and then doubt. These are the five that are not present on that occasion. And what are the seven factors of enlightenment that go to fulfillment and development on that occasion? The enlightenment factor of mindfulness goes to fulfillment and development on that occasion. So this gives you um, another look at um, the idea that these things do not just happen uh, finally in your practice, like bang, and they've never happened before along the way. You see, it's interesting because if you're intent on knowing the truth and you're listening to a Dhamma talk directly from the text, the Buddha's words, let me preface, that's what this really means. Then at that time, you, you are, um, you are, um, At that time, what's happening is that you are um, experiencing a, like a temporary, like a mundane Nibbana. It's not quite the same thing, but temporarily they come to complete fulfillment, you see. So it's telling you something in this paragraph by stating it that way. It's letting you know that you can experience a temporary still point or pure mind, like during when you're practicing, we tell you when you're doing the steps of the six R's, when you recognize something and then you release it in between where you relax and you smile. It's that tiny of a spot. There is a point of absolutely no craving at all. It's a demonstration that cessation state is real. Now, how can you see that? Well, the beginner cannot see it. So if they throw up their hands and say, there isn't any tension, you're, you're just being silly or something like that, it's because they haven't done it long enough to become, be sitting long enough and do it and be having the awareness going faster and sharper and uh, the brain speed may be slowing down, which I know neurologically this isn't true, but that's the way it seems to you because it seems like this is um, slow motion. I don't know if you had this experience, but I think that you have sat deep enough at the retreat. Maybe you experienced, this is really cool. I can watch this stuff very clearly, but you know, as a medical person, how fast that's going in the brain. So uh, what I'm saying is, you know, it, this is the way it appears to the meditator as they get more proficient in their meditation. The, um, this car was going like this, okay? And this car was going like um, uh, 50, say, say 60, 60 miles per hour, okay? And your car is going, um, let me see, this one, yeah, okay. I mean, this is you, this is you at, at like 50 miles an hour. And the brain is going like really fast at 70 or 90 miles an hour, okay? And my example, I had a neurologist tell me this is not correct. I said, it's not correct, but how do you explain this? Because what happens is if we start meditating here and our mindfulness is our observation, you know? That's our, um, our observation power. And somehow your observation power speeds up. Now, what I learned when I was driving once with the kids and this man was driving his car, okay, is that if, I, if, if um, I'm at 50 miles an hour and he passes me at 90 miles an hour, I can't see anybody in the car. 
I can't identify them, see their face, see what they're wearing or anything. However, what happens is if I'm able to drive the same speed beside the other person, you know, if we go to 50 miles an hour, we were doing this and the kids were talking to each other out the window, his kids and my kids, it was really funny, on a holiday and nobody else is on the highway around us at all, no one. And, and, um, and we did this, you know, um, okay. And what, and what happened was that I could see the people in the car and I could see the tie the man was wearing and the design on his tie. And I could see the woman and the, what was the pattern on her dress and everything perfectly. So my, my explanation was something speeding up is my observation skills speeding up to the speed of the brain or what? And of course the neurologist he fried me right where I was. He cooked me. He said, the brain is not slowing down. I said, I know the brain is still firing, but I think what's happening somehow is that the, the mindfulness, the observation point is changing. And when we're very still and we're sitting there, something is either, either this is slowing down and, and Medically, they're saying that's not slowing down. So this must be speeding up. This is a lay person's interpretation of this, not a medical person. I told him that. And I said, you've experienced it. He said, yes. So explain it to me. And he said, I can't. <laughs> that was funny. So he didn't come up with another simile for me of how this is happening. But this is how you are, you are seeing. You get what I mean? Yeah. So can I ask a question, sister? Sure. If you are finished, then we can. Uh, I, I can go ahead with my. Yeah, question. we should. We should do questions now for a little bit. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So I'm uh, really very uh, glad with uh, today's session because a lot of things uh, just clicked in my mind. You know about these uh, hindrances and enlightenment factors, and it just fell into place. So thank you very much. Uh, first I'm of all, so yeah. I'm glad. And, yeah. Second uh, thing which I have to ask is uh, that I'm left with a paradox because on the one hand we say that uh, don't take things personally and uh, there's no one in control and on the other hand you're explaining that uh, you are indeed uh, uh, controlling the direction of your mind. When you're talking about the instruction to take things personally, it has to be an active practice to attain this, you know, active decision. It has to become, I, I've done this with people. This is what I do with my own students. I tell them, you have to have a notebook. When I'm putting them on retreat now, you have to have a notebook, okay? A small notebook. And when something happens at work and you come home and you write down in there what happened in this disagreement with this person in the office, I, you have, you are training all the time. You are learning this meditation, you are training your brain. This is what you're doing. You're, you are brain, actually brainwashing your brain to change its neural pathways. And instead of taking things personally, from now on, your habit is going to be forgive, listen, and choose an impersonal observation of what essentially is going on instead of what you're I'm consumed by what is unessentially involved with what's going on here now. Yeah, but a, uh, yeah, but we are directing towards the wholesome and uh, releasing the unwholesome. So there is a direction to the direction to the movement of the mind, and uh, that direction is given uh, by someone, right? <laughs> that's given by that's given by the Buddha here. He's giving it to you. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no. That's 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 fine. I'm saying in the meditation, the direction is given. Uh, uh, I, I mean, there is someone to give that direction. It's not without a control. Don't don't get lost in self and no self, please. Yeah. Very very important. Mm -hmm. Dismiss the inter the the definition self and no self the, the translation and say personally or do it this way you would do it this way anyway medically you would say okay her pro the problem is let's deduce what is the problem for this person okay this whole incident happened because she took personally what 
he said or vice versa and there was a huge argument and a fight now she's hurt all right so what happened here was she automatically took what was she's she's of course she is from the angle of a self would be selfishly acting and protecting herself all the time and this has been trained into her so what how do i say this let's try again self and no self you have to go back to this point it was never about a self and a no self a non-self it was about the consequences of believing there was a self versus the consequence of trying out the perspective there is no self so then we take what is the consequence of a self and it moves into a self direction everything is about me mine it is myself what i see hear smell taste touch what i think it's all about me it leads us to narcissism right so now let's look at non-self if we said non-self what is the consequence of non-self and the consequence of non-self is selflessness is compassion loving kindness is waiting and considering all the things that talking about you developing for your behavior pattern comes out of not taking things you're immediately assuming that it's about me it's mine it's myself and therefore everything in my life is happening to me nothing is happening from me it's all happening to me because i am but what if I am not. What if just suppose, and this is not something you can tell somebody, say, doctor, you are not, I am not, we're all in a hologram. You want to play with that, it's okay, but they better know a lot about quantum physics if you're going to start with the hologram concept, okay? <laughs> but you can play with the children and say, what if it's not, what if you took things not personally? What if you considered with compassion for a moment maybe something's wrong for that person maybe they're not really yelling at me what if they're not yelling at you they're yelling about themselves as parents when we uh, yell at our children if we look at what's happening in that situation we can find out many times it's the parent who is feeling inadequate it's my fault you've done this it's me that caused this you're the way you are because of me true or not true it doesn't matter they're blaming themselves automatically now they're angry and they're going to come at the child you see so if you what i tell them about the notebook now i'm training you when i take you uh to the notebook you go back to that point um what do what what happens okay and what happens is you write down the incident the way you saw it happen and what happened and you they got angry you got angry everything happened now turn the page write this incident again down and write it so that you don't respond what would have happened if you didn't take anything that happened personally how would it change and my students figure out immediately i could have done this differently where do I get that knowledge? You're getting that knowledge all through the Buddhist teaching. You see, compassion is pausing and considering that something might be wrong with someone. We have to go back to the definition of conflict and understand that. A number of years ago, it slapped me in the face when I was in the peace movement at one point. All this conflict is happening because one person takes action based on assumption without information. Everything, all of the conflict that started, all the wars that caused everything, going into Iraq, it was all a big mistake, you see? And now they, ex they, ex they ex admit it was a big mistake. There wasn't anything in there. It was all about something else. But the point is that one person takes action based on assumption, without information, first getting the information of what's really going on and then taking action. Therefore, we have all of this conflict. Therefore, Perel has a job. <laughs> no, anybody has a job because, because this is where it comes back to. 
Why am I carrying the whole world on top of me? Why am I beating myself down and passing out and breaking out and crying? And if you look at what you're crying about and you write it down, it's in the past. So what does it come back to? This comes back to you better not teach, start teaching your students without teaching them the Bada Rakata Sutta first. And it's the primary lesson we give anybody in any religion. You don't have to be Buddhist. It's about the past and the future and the present time and the truth of it. And we don't learn this in school. And this is the pity of all of this. All of this depression. So which, uh, which sutta did you say, sister? Yeah, the Bada Rakata. Bada Rakata Sutta. I'll write it for you. And it's really interesting because it's um, 130. Oh, I will, uh, I will read it on my own. You just yeah. uh, tell yeah. me the number. Yeah. The thing I want to point out to you is it's in there four times in a row. So it must have been important. And when I mm -hmm. went back to try to find why is this so important, I found out that um, the reason was because in the old days, the teachers, they didn't teach their students meditation before they taught them this lesson. That's why it's in there. So it's, um, it's not, the sutta number is, um, 131, 132, 133, and 134. It's the only one in the whole entire book that's in there four times. Okay, the first time it is addressed to one monk, and the second time we see the title is to Ananda, and the third time it's to Mahakach Mahakachana, and the fourth time that it appears, it is written. The Loma, uh, let's see, Loma Sakangaya, Loma Sakangaya. So, but the, but the verse is exactly the same. The lesson is exactly the same. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state let him know that and be sure of it invincibly, unshakably. It's an invitation to understand how things work. Today, the effort must be made. Tomorrow, death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his lords away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly by day and night, it is he that peaceful sage has said, who will have a single excellent night. This is what you read before you go to bed. Dwell on the past and drag it up in your mind. You cannot live in the present. Perel will agree with me, I'm sure. If you're living completely in the past and you're stuck there, you are not alive. This is a fact. You are not alive if you are consumed with the worry of the future constantly in your mind. And I went through a lot with this whole thing in America that's been going on. And I have to back up all the time and say, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you have to come back here right now. And the only time you're alive is in the present time in your little car floating along as you go along. This is my new little car. See, it's got a little roof. <laughs> it moves, it just moves along and you're inside of it, inside this little car. You are alive, fully alive. But the moment you open the trunk, like this, you know, you open that trunk, oh, it won't pop. <laughs> the minute you open the trunk, see, like that, and put stuff in there. This stuff is poured in there. My, my vitamins are in there, see? But you put it, all these past things and you're carrying them with you. And now you can't steer your little car. So actually what you're going to Perel for is you want to steer the car better. She'll say, check your gas, check your oil, check your brake fluid. <laughs> <laughs> Look at your everything first. You're, you're healthy. There's nothing wrong with your brain. Nothing wrong with you. You just have to dump this stuff out and you got a perfect little way of living life. Live the present time. Forget about the moment. It's going awful fast. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is live there. You see? You see what I mean? Yeah.
So when you when you read that, it's a really short sutta. First one's only two pages long. Next one's three pages. Then it goes back to two pages. The last one might be four pages. There's nothing new in it. And it has the same verse. And you know that all the monks were required to learn that verse in the old days. That's what old teacher told me. He's in his 90s. Everybody knew that by heart. Because any villager, it didn't matter who they were, or what religion or faith or anything, they could learn that in their mind, you know, and kept that first verse, the first part of it. It was enough to keep them going. Yeah. Thank you. Question. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah? you. Yeah. So if, you, if you get a copy of the, the Samyutta Nikaya, it's a good book to have around. Because the next thing we'll do once we finally retire these hindrances at some point, the problem with the hindrances is they're always there <laughs> and they're always willing to come up. But we can, this, this book is designed a special way. It's designed with a section on just feelings. And then it's designed with a section just on the book of causation, dependent origination as 89 suttas. And then when you get out of there, you have the aggregates, and then you get the feelings, and then you get enlightenment factors, the joy, the Bojanga Sutta, you see? And then it has the great book. So several of those sections are unbelievably clear when it comes to your meditation. And yeah. you know, when you've been practicing twim and then you go there, wow, we are doing it the right way. That's what it seems like because you're making progress. You're yeah. not, you know? Yeah, yeah twim, yeah, twim uh, the twim practice does look uh, very simple on the surface, but it does uh, take you uh, deep right there where, where, where you need to go. It's good. At these different levels have different levels of relief. And just getting you to experience such a thing as uplifted joy can exist. My ladies came prancing in here this morning. I, they gave them the instructions just for the weekend in Hindi. They went home and they read them. I slept for two days. I feel great now. I think the whole thing was about sleep, if you want my opinion. You know, and, <laughs> and finally, they walked in. I said, what's going on? It's like they were walking in with their eyes this big, and they're trying to express to me, you know, what this is. And it's like, we're, I said, you feel good? Mm, you happy? Oh, <laughs> did you practice and you got happy? Oh, yeah. So they're feeling uplifted joy. You know, there are monks that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s. They've never felt that one day in their whole life as a monk. <laughs> amazing it's amazing and there's people who have been going for so very long and never never had any of these experiences and been told stories about how they're not even available now well the point is you have a set of instructions and i think what is the thing that they tell you in um mental health if you do <laughs> somebody told me this when i it may have been my doctor who told me, I think he told me this. He says, you know, there's a saying. And I said, what? And he said, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, you expect a different result, but you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's the definition of insanity. That's what he told me. And I think I went out of there laughing about it because I could see so many things I was doing wrong, you know, that that I needed, I, I, nobody ever told me anything about it. There are no, no discussions when I was growing up, nothing, you see? And I, you know, that's just something that just happened. And one of the most damaging things in the world is to have your parents, one, one was gone, the other one and her mother, my mother and grandmother were drinking buddies. So they weren't home. They weren't home when you got home from school, they weren't there. So my solution was always to leave <laughs> and just go to my best friend's house or go to the farm and give birth to the cows and the sheep and everything and work on the farm because I loved it so much, you know, it was just to go there and spend time there. 
But these people were not there to inform me on this. And so learning this now after and learning what I could have, things could have been different. It's sure it's true, but things happened the way they happened. The reason they happened was so I could be here now. <laughs> That's the way I look at the whole thing now, you know? But they're, they're gone now and you can't talk to them, but uh, they weren't home is the only way to put it. They were not home. You could come home and ask them a question and it was like, oh yes, pass the ice or yes, pass the whatever. But there wasn't any communication. And I don't know how I managed, <laughs> except I wanted answers. I didn't want to escape. I wanted answers and my saving grace was museums and intellectual people who were my friends, doctors and, you know, uh, medical people and scientists that I, my family knew that were the saving grace. Just keep asking questions. And oh boy, did I ask questions. And that's what people need to learn. Because if you're going to get knowledge, which is the foundation for wisdom, and you all want the wisdom, you have to have the knowledge first to see how everything works. And that's it. That's what we're doing with you. Yeah? yeah. So okay. It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. We should, we should do our prayer and we should all get sleep. <laughs> I love good sleep now. <laughs> okay, so let's go. May suffering ones be May suffering, suffering and the fear struck fearless be. May, may the grief shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting states and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Blessings, blessings. Have a good week.